Welcome to Coaching Uncaged, the podcast on all things coaching, brought to you by Animas. And now introducing your host, Yannick Jacob. Hetty Einzig, it is so fantastic to uh, welcome you back because you've been with us. Uh, with us, uh, Nick has interviewed you in 2018 on a very early episode of the Coaching Uncaged podcast. So uh, it is wonderful to have you back. And I'm so looking forward to this. Welcome to welcome here. It's a pleasure, Yannick. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, we've had many interesting conversations. Not enough. So this is another treat to have a, a long conversation. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting mm -hmm. me. I, I always say I'm very excited, but this one definitely particularly, just because, you know, you mentioned we had some conversations. Um, Animas was organizing these intimate dinner events where they would invite, you know, a thought leader and then have like eight spaces or something. I absolutely love that. Um, but like, that's, I think, the first time I met you in person. And um, I really like what you bring to this space because you have uh, quite an illustrious career. I hate reading bios, but also it's uh, it's difficult to find one on your website. You you don't you don't make a big deal about who you are as a person. It's really about uh, issues that matter and questions that matter. And I, I really like that. Um, but but still, for the people who are watching this or listening to this, I, I think it, it can be helpful to get a sense for where people talk from. So you've uh, you've introduced yourself. You told a bit of a story uh, to Nick. So I'll, I'll refer anybody who uh, is keen to get to know you a bit better uh, to that episode. Uh, it was in back in 2018, pre-pandemic. Uh, but you've done a lot of things. Uh, um, uh, you developed a, a coaching program with Sir John Whitmore, uh, coaching for performance. Uh, you've been doing some work with uh, Performance Consultants International, who developed the Grow model. So uh, you've it, it would be. Uh, futile to uh, list all of the things that you've done. You've got a lot of career uh, management consulting career. You've done work in the arts and media. Uh, you've been a psychotherapist for decades. You've been, yeah. I think it was the first TV program uh, counseling. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot you've been doing with people, psychology, but bringing in culture and art and media. And I, that integration of things is I think something that is quite important as a coach to have many different influences so yeah. gosh I, I mean become you can become my my pr person yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i hadn't i had completely forgotten about the tv program yeah i did i did the whole of the first series of uh, a problem shared um mm -hmm. and yeah and that was fascinating as well i it, it, it what's important isn't it is is the life lived not not being able to list all one's uh, achievements and I, I don't know they don't they don't uh, I, I've not chased um, you know accreditations and accolades and, and stars and stripes and things so much in my life but I, I think you put it so well that, that it's the integration of the different strands of one's life when you live a life and you think so what meaning does this have and how does this link up with that and how is it connected and um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. You know, as I said, I I, I was doing a, a masterclass this moment, this morning, and we live at such interesting times in history. I was at the masterclass was about resilience for the Irish Management Institute, an hour and a half. And as I was preparing and thinking more and more about it, we tend to think of resilience so much as a personal. I have personal resilience, mm. or we might, if we think beyond that that an organization has resilience, but actually we don't often link the two and link these with context. And our personal resilience is always a function mm -hmm. of the integration mm -hmm. of how we interact with where we live. You're about to go and live in Berlin, which is very mm -hmm. exciting and will change you. Of course it will. It will change you immeasurably. And, um, it's where we live, it's the context, but it's also, and also, not but, it's also the, the social, political, environmental context within which we live, because we are imaginative creatures, and so we have an imaginarium, you know, we have within us the space mm. where we hold the symbols, the images, the pictures, the stories, the narratives, the, the key incidents uh, of, of our lives and, mm -hmm. and of the world around us. Yeah. And I think all of these, uh, impact our sense of self, which has become more and more fluid. As, as we know, we live in a 
uh, what Zygmunt Bowen calls a liquid society. Huh. You know, more and more, the, our boundaries are porous. We're, we're beginning to understand that more and more. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll say I mean, more about this as we go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's many points I could already mm. pick up on. Um, I love where this, what this is opening up. But like, mm. why is this important? Is the first question that comes to my mind here. Why is it important that a coach has made their own experience that coaches perhaps go seek experiences and to integrate when um, we we want to be there for a client and help them uh, develop or integrate? Um, wh why do you say it's important uh, well, that it's, we are out in life? More, it's more than important. I think it's critical mm -hmm. because you as a coach, I as a coach, we are instruments through which something travels and in and interacts with and impacts upon another person or a place or whatever. So when we are coaching an individual, we're not some robot or some, and even that would be, that would not be uh, an objective. There's no such thing as being able to be neutral and objective because your very presence mm -hmm. has an impact. It's a relationship. Mm -hmm. We talk about building rapport, building relationship with the, with the coaching. And, um, you know, every question you ask, every time you raise an eyebrow or smile or, you know, shift in your chair is conveying messages all the time. The body is a constant. We, as bodies, as total bodies, are constantly uh, like a sort of, um, how do they put it in polyvagal theory? You know, that, that we're sort of, we're, we're sort of um, like radar all mm -hmm. the time. Is this a safe place? Or is this not mm. a safe place? Mm -hmm. Is this someone I want to interact with? Is this not somebody I want to interact with? Do I feel valued by this person or not? Do I feel mm -hmm. safe? And feeling safe isn't just, am I going to be killed by a great grizzly bear? Feeling safe <laughs> is also, do I feel valued? Do I feel accepted? Do I feel you know, that I have a place here, that I have something mm -hmm. to offer, that I can, can be myself? And so if you as a coach just come with a really clever list of questions. I mean, you know, nice list of questions is great. It's valuable, yeah. Valuable, always. We, we need tools and we need frameworks. Of course we do, we need ideas. But who you are will convey itself uh, just as powerfully, maybe even more powerfully, I would suggest, mm -hmm. than the words you speak. I mean, Peter Drucker said it years ago, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of great king of management theory. He said, you know, the first thing as a leader is to manage your own energy, you know, to take, and by manage, he meant, you know, uh, yeah, take care of yourself, but, but also be aware mm -hmm. of what your energy is doing, how you're feeling, because your energy then will 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 impact yeah. the other person long before you say anything or, or ask a clever question yeah. so so as a coach i think um so that's the first reason is that we're not just instruments we're not just you know flutes through which a higher question is going to come through us that there's music being played here hmm. and the second reason is is that i think we live in very very interesting times to borrow the chinese word <laughs> it's a curse chinese curse you know we live in we live in times it had been called a watershed in history um uh paul hawkin who i'm a big fan of uh environmentalist and an activist and businessman in the states he said this is a watershed and i, I think he's right and, and many people would agree um so it's not that these are more anxious times than other people have been anxious since history began. But I think mm. that it really is a watershed about the future of the human presence on this planet. I think yeah. the planet it will survive, but the human species, uh, species extinction is in the balance. Not quite, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not quite sure where it's going to go. So, so therefore, coaching isn't just about having, uh, helping someone to higher performance. It's yeah. also about creating that space where some of the bigger challenges, the beyond, you know, as you know, I'm a transpersonal coach, which is the program I developed with John, and maybe we'll come back and talk about that. It's, the human being is also, your client is also an instrument. Your client is also someone who has contribution to make, who wants to find meaning and purpose in their life, who yeah. wants to uh, find a space that is uh, creative, safe enough to feel valued, but creative, so challenging enough to push the boundaries a little, where they can maybe face some of yeah. 
those questions in a way that's palatable, that's, that's accessible to them. And that's yeah. going to be different for every client. And mm. so if you as a coach don't have access to some of the broader experiences, how can you share that kind mm. of a conversation with your coach? And I, I'm looking always for partnership between a coach. Yeah. And that there's something about resonance that, you know, so many coaches would say, oh, I, I know, I know what that's like because they had a similar experience. I mean, phenomenologically, we all have vastly different experiences, even if we witness the same thing. But I think there's something about uh, us being able to resonate with what's going on for another person and they are feeling that kind of resonance. I think there's a safety in, in a space where someone who has traveled, for example, uh, who has been exposed to difference and who has had really challenging times in their lives. Um, as long as we don't assume that our experience is comparable to what this other person is going through, I think that resonance is an important one. And as you mentioned, in these times, it's it can be difficult to feel safe when we take a couple of steps back, maybe a couple of more, and then another couple of more, and think about you know the state of the world, uh, particularly in the context of you know climate disaster. Um, well, creating these spaces where a leader or anybody really, you know, a leader can be a leader of their own lives, head of their own body, head of the department, head of a country, um, where, where they can feel safe, at least for the moment, to do some really important thinking with someone who's resonating. It, the, the value of that is immense. And Almost. let me, let me, let me, ask you this because I wanted to ask you about this and you just touched upon it. Uh, you obviously, you wrote The Future of Coaching, a book that I absolutely loved. Uh, and Nick said it's a book that he would have wanted to write. <laughs> you know? uh, so, highest, uh, highest compliment. I, I think so too. Uh, and it's it's well-deserved because it's fantastic. Everybody, I think, uh, will do well reading it. It's really inspiring. Um, but you wrote it in 2017. You were on the podcast here early 2018. Obviously, then uh, in late 2019, early 2020, uh, the pandemic came about. The future of coaching, a lot has happened in lot people's happened. Uh, people's ideas of what coaching can contribute and what the role of coaching is in order to, uh, you know, contribute to where this world is going. So could you talk into that space? What's happened since you wrote that book? No, it's a great question and thank you for the invitation because as you you know me well enough to know this is a space I love to climb into, you know, to, to explore mm -hmm. what has been happening, what has been happening and, and, and what is the context within which we are coaching or partnering with leaders as, as I like to put it also. Oof, I mean, a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Even before the pandemic, I was saying that I think that working with the body and somatic intelligence becoming a lot more uh, literate around the body. What are, what are the messages from the body? How can we live more in our body? How can we understand the brain as something that is completely all over the body, not just in the head, not even just in the head, the heart and the gut, but actually every time we touch, we're getting intelligence. How do we interact with the spaces? The human being as, as porous rather than bounded. And, and, and that's a concept already in transpersonal coaching, this idea of we're both one, unitary, but we're also multiple. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's one idea. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm seeing that as becoming really increasingly center stage in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've just come back, as I said to you, from visiting the Biennale in Venice, which has been going for 125, 123 years, something like this. Every two years, the, the, a curator is appointed and they invite artists of every shape, size, form, culture from all over the world. And so you have hundreds mm -hmm. and hundreds. There's a real immersion. And the theme of the body is big, big, big. Now, you could say, OK, the body has always, always been big in art. But what, what's <laughs> happening right now is this idea of that, that some philosophers are talking about, particularly people like um, Rosie, I think she's called Barotti. What's, what's her surname? I've just got Bridotti, Bridotti. I've just got her book and I'm just about to read it here. She's a feminist philosopher. That we are now uh, beginning to challenge really seriously challenge the whole anthropos, the whole idea of the anthropocentric view of it. And with that, we challenge the view of the man and the human. What does mm -hmm. it mean to be human today? So uh, 
on the one hand, you have this whole uh, love of um, technology and, and science. And I think this is, this is the big, since I was writing, it's become more and more center stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the one hand, you have people who love the technology, you know, every new device and, yeah, and if I could have a chip, you know, that would remember everything, that would be fabulous. And you know what, technology is going to save us from all the big challenges and so on and so on. Real romantic faith in technology. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have those who really dread it and who are terrified of it. It's, you know, artificial intelligence is going to take mm -hmm. away our jobs, automation. I remember working with some uh, a group of lawyers and they were saying, oh, you know, Tesco law is coming in. And what do you mean by Tesco? Well, you know, you can just go online now and you can just purchase a will and you can purchase your new insurance and you can, you can do it yourself. You know, cheap and cheerful, I think, was Tesco. Mm -hmm. Parche and forgive me, Tesco, but, you know, this idea of <laughs> cheap and cheerful. Um, and so and you've got people who love it on the one hand and others who dread it. And in the middle, it's challenging. What does it mean to be human? If if the mm -hmm. cyborg has come, you know, mm -hmm. in the middle of the 80s, this is way before you and I were kind of well, probably writing and thinking. Donna Haraway was writing the cyborg manifesto, this idea mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. actually human beings can become anything. We can become robots. We can become, and maybe they will take over. And there's mm -hmm. lots of sci-fi films and so on. So that's all happening on the one hand. The other thing I think that has risen and will be affecting our coaching and where we're going and our thinking is the whole, uh, I call it contested realities, this idea that all the things that we thought were not even, well, we didn't even think about them because we've just been brought up and this is the water we swim in, which is the essentially the legacy of empire. Mm -hmm. You and I are, are despite our, our difference in ages, we're all, we, we, we are, uh, you know, we've inherited a world of big empires mm -hmm. where countries, whether it's Germany, your country, or where you come from, and, or Britain, where I was born, you know, going out and conquering other people and saying, we're the best. And yes, there's a lot of harm done. But you know what, in the end, it's for the best, because we bring civilization, we bring <laughs> culture, we bring learning and structure and the rule of law. Mm. And we're going to make your country, the trains run on time, you know, famous, you know, what was it? <laughs> what fun was fact, they aren't. <laughs> well, yeah. And this is all being big time challenged. Yeah. And when you challenge the foundation story, you know, I was brought up always that on the whole, the British Empire was a good thing. You know, mm. it was, and, and it's what, of course, built the wealth. And if you look around you, all the wealth of the big nations, whether it's Germany or France or Italy or, 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 or all the big European nations, and of course, preeminent America, it's been built on the exploitation and extraction yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of people and resources and, and mm -hmm. mineral resources and all the rest of it from other countries. And now we're actually talking about this. Now yeah. this is it. So when you talk about these things and you challenge it and you say, and with that, of course, went enlightenment mm. thinking, the idea of rational man, mm -hmm. rational man, that get rid of all this emotional stuff, I mean, rational, we make clear decisions. And of course, most businesses are still built in that mold. Our yeah. job is to make maximum amount of shareholder value, maximum amount of money, and we make decisions rationally. Yeah. Yeah, because Germany and the UK have become Completely. Apple and Amazon, and Completely. there is Absolutely. there isn't that same level of uh, foundation in terms of values, or we bring education, or we bring cultural systems. I mean, there are cultural systems that they bring, they just have a very global dubious, perspective. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. <laughs> so what what we've seen over the last uh, ten years, as you as you so rightly say, is instead of the institutions of nation and state. We have the institutions of Apple and Amazon and mm -hmm. Microsoft and, and, and Google and, and so on. Um, and but even within their, that, their values are certainly not the same about hmm. necessarily service to humanity. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, yeah no, um, I, I'm interrupted. But like, uh, it, it strikes me oh. that even within those systems, there seems to be a reconnection with the body. And sometimes that's just playing, paying lip service and trying to make people perform better. Uh, but I, I in, in many organizations, that's I know that to be genuine, that, uh, you know, yeah. there is a trend to take more care of your people and uh, more and more leaders um, have understood. But if you yes. take good care of your people, that's that's, that's sustainable story. I think that's an old story. That's the story that says happy workers make good workers. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're challenged, the challenge is even deeper than that. What we as we contest 
the kind of realities we were brought up in. And whether it's the empire of, uh, of, of Britain, Germany or the United States, or whether it's the empire of Apple, Amazon and Google, there's still empires, there's still this pyramidal structure of dominance. Mm -hmm. And so you've got all the technological stuff happening. I think there's a lot of, of listening to new voices. Mm -hmm. So I think that very significant that came out of the pandemic, one was that, wow, the body is really fragile. Mm -hmm. And with our fragility, wow, maybe we look around at there's a lot more fragility than we had thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Systems were fragile. Industries Systems were fragile. fragile. Industries you know, were fragile. Relationships were stra fragile. So many, much fragility that was revealed. Absolutely. And this has really shaken us. And mm -hmm. so with that, I think there's a rise in an understanding of the importance of care. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're right. I think there's been a big shift of people thinking, whoa, actually, even if this isn't about getting people to work better, we actually have a duty of care and to take care mm -hmm. of, of our workers. I think care is coming. Um, there's a, it's what I'm writing at the moment, I'm writing an essay about the ethics of care and, mm -hmm. and, and care, compassion and, and so on. And I think the, the other voices we're hearing, so women, big time now, rising to the top, very interesting at the Biennale, that the majority of uh, uh, artists, contributors were women, mm. again, from all over. And the other thing that's coming up, uh, as well as listening to black and ethnic minority voices, we're starting to pay intelligent and respectful attention to indigenous voices. Mm -hmm. It used to be the exoticization of the mm -hmm. indigenous. A few feathers here, a few wonderful photographs of you know, North American indigenous, you know, uh, headdresses and so on. And it was all a, a, a exoticization. And now they are uh, contributing increasingly in their own right, mm -hmm. as equals, mm -hmm. with an alternative ont ontology. Mm -hmm. So instead of worldviews being dominated by the Western, educated, industrialized, and I can't remember what the R and the D stands for. I think democratic is the last one. Um, you know, this idea of weird, you've probably heard mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is not the only way to look at the world. So I think that when we're, we're coaching now, we are so much more sensitized, not just to diversity, tick, lip service, mm -hmm. but <laughs> actually the essential nature, the absolute you know, um, imperative of mm -hmm. diversity if we want resilient systems, mm -hmm. if we're going to survive at all. Yeah. But we're, we're beginning to see the sort of impoverishment of this yeah. rigid anthropocentric yeah. view. Yeah, and you, you know, I wanted to ask you about transformation, and I think there is a real transformation that has taken place um, in terms of, like, uh, George Floyd murders, all of this diversity coming in, um, it got people to think about it. I, I think many people we mentioned paid lip service, but I, I think it did uh, cause a shift. Um, what's happening in Iran right now with the women rising up, there's, that caused a shift. Ten years ago, um, with what they called the Arab Spring, there was a shift. Uh, there, these shifts, they continue to happen, and they continue to happen more often. And I, I think it's very much needed. I wonder what kind of transformation needs to take place, if you wanted to call it that. I'm not sure on your perspective of transformation, but the, mm. something is needed in terms of our mindset, our consciousness, uh, in order to take this into a in the direction where we don't get wiped out by AI or we don't destroy our planet. So I'm curious about what the role of coaching and coaches individually is uh, mm -hmm. that we can contribute to this and whether we should even take responsibility for contributing to this. You talk about, uh, I saw you writing about uh, coaching as a noble profession, mm -hmm. right? And there's, mm -hmm. there's a conversation about, well, should coaches have an agenda of doing something noble or are we working in the interest of the client? So I guess the direction that I would I would invite you to jump into is the role of coaching in this current climate with all of these changes and wanting to perhaps contribute something, but also questioning whether that's our role. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a tricky one. I think it's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. I don't have a clear answer and you'll get a different answer according to who you speak to. Of course you will. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think I've, you know, I, I have... Uh, uh, shown my hand as it were i've declared my my belief that uh that 
coaches are not just there to serve the client. I think we have a disruptive role as well. I think we have, mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of captured when you say, you know, we need to be supportive and challenging. Well, if we're challenging, hmm. challenge can be disruptive. Oh, and yeah. We're, we're encouraging people to, to, uh, to think beyond the tram lines, to think beyond the comfort zone. And John and I used to talk about this a lot, um, that, you know, if we believe in, um, in, in awareness in that, that the bottom line is to help our clients raise their awareness and take responsibility. And it's contained in that sentence, isn't it? It's contained in mm -hmm. that sentence. Raise their awareness of what? Well, hmm. not just raise my awareness of, of, of what's happening around me and how I can make more money. But, you know, it, 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 you take that, as a coach, you're going to take that in the direction. Whether you know it or not, you'll be influencing your client towards mm -hmm. the kinds of values and the things that you think are important because that's where you're, you know, unless you're very, very careful mm. <laughs> to, to, to not stay. And, and I think that's even then, even then, even then. And I, so, you know, I always tell clients a little bit about me because I say, look, we're going to be having a dialogue with me. You need to know where I'm coming from. And mm -hmm. I believe in human contribution. I believe that we hear that our, that the mandate, if you like, today is regeneration and restoration and so on and so on. Uh, and that become, that also involves reparation. Taking a mature human being takes responsibility for themselves mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have some organizations that still behave like toddlers. You know, <laughs> they, think they can go out there, grab what they want and, and, and not, not get any consequences. And we know that that's no longer true. And I think as coaches, our, our job is to play many roles with our client, you know, partly with their, uh, above all, and, and uh, above all, in my view, we are partnering with our client. And that means being an ally, but it doesn't always mean being their best friend. And it doesn't always be, mean being on their side and saying, yes, everything you want to do goes. Sometimes it means helping them access their own sense of conscience, or sometimes it might, mean helping them um, take a wider perspective on something you know mm -hmm. yeah you might want to read this or you know we're talking about X and it could be interesting for you to to, 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 to think in this along these lines so so the, this is the role I think coaches can play and this goes right back to what we were talking about right at the beginning Yannick about it's really important I mean I think this is the best job in the world because you know <laughs> it's like it's part of developing ourselves isn't it yeah life. So every uh -huh. time you travel, you're thinking, oh, how, you know, taking time to reflect, how is this enriching me? What am I learning here? Uh, this great pleasure and enjoyment. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I, I personally have introduced a lot more uh, body wisdom, um, body work in a very light touch way into my mm -hmm. coaching. And I plan to do more. I plan to do more. How do you do that? Uh, could you give us some examples yeah, of how you I introduce can. these things? I can. So very often I begin by uh, using a centering technique that I learned when I was, I've done a number of workshops with uh, an embodiment teacher called Wendy Palmer mm -hmm. uh, from the United States. And she, she has a website called Leadership Embodiment. And I like her work very, very much. Um, and it's based on Aikido and she does a centering technique when this is not a meditation and it's not a grounding because in Aikido you're moving all the time how can you come back and really feel so you if anybody skis they know what I'm talking about if you're a skier you your your center of gravity has to be in the pelvis it has mm -hmm. to be around the around the hips and the pelvis and you see the low center of gravity mm -hmm. and that's where the movement comes from and that's what keeps you from falling over and it's exactly the same in aikido and it's the same in the centering technique so i get people to breathe um and we breathe up our spine when we breathe in which gives us that sense of dignity of extension of uh, strength, mobile and tensile strength. So it's strength mm -hmm. with adaptability. Mm -hmm. And then when we breathe out, we breathe down the front of our, 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 our body. Imagine, we imagine that the breath is traveling down the front of our body. And this brings expansion and openness and mm -hmm. And incredibly, it is sort of encapsulating, you know, shoulders down the back, relax, because most of us are doing this all the time because we're you know, mm -hmm. in front of screens and hunched. Um, so 
remind we can let go of our shoulders we don't need them to hold us up <sighs> relax and this breathing technique reminds us that what we want from our leaders and what we want from our coach because in a sense we're all leaders is we want strength but we mm -hmm. want heart we want mm -hmm. warmth we want openness mm -hmm. And it comes from this Aikido practice that when the enemy or the uh, opponent comes towards you, instead of running away or meeting force with force, which would be the very Western way, like boxing, mm -hmm. we meet force with flow. Mm -hmm. We open and we come towards what frightens us or we come towards what makes us angry mm -hmm. uh, with an aspect of curiosity. And to me, this seems to me so beautifully encapsulating the coaching attitude that you know our job is not to sit there going oh my god i hate this client you know this he frightens me or it's to, oh, how can i stay centered and open and be yeah. curious because then i then i can be of some help yeah and that's the most important part in aikido as i know it is that kind of balance and groundedness exactly. because you can move with and yeah. it's it, the other the opponent gets out of balance because you move with and then you can influence very lightly a very light touch can get someone completely out of balance because there is this groundedness and it's very difficult for someone who is so grounded to knock them out of balance you can move you're quite flexible i see a lot of that happening in the coaching room and when the coach is grounded as that you can move with your opponents in quotation marks for those of you who are uh, listening yeah, yeah. um our partner let's call, yeah, let's exactly call you're, you're, we're all, we partner all the time Oh, of course. So your partner, you move with yeah, them with and them. there's yeah. there's some dynamic and sometimes it can get quite stormy, right? Uh, yeah. But if you do that in a constructive way and you continue to stay grounded uh, and you move together, amazing things happen. Exactly. And that's the twist in language, isn't it? You know, there's this wonderful quote that we, we um, don't describe what we see. We mm -hmm. see what we describe. So if mm. instead of seeing on, let's say I'm on the Aikido mat, instead of seeing, and I don't do Aikido by the way, but if I were, you don't see an opponent, I see a partner. Then your mm -hmm. whole attitude flips because, yeah. oh, okay, how can we do really interesting dance? Remember, it's a non-violent martial art, you know, exactly as you've described, exactly yeah. as you've described. So I, I, language I, is very important here and, you know. Yeah, I don't do Aikido either, but uh, I see a lot of parallels. I played capoeira for many years. Oh, um, yeah. Now my knees have kind of given up, uh, so I have to find a way. But in capoeira, you <laughs> don't fight. Like you play, you play capoeira and okay. you need two people. You cannot do, exactly. if you do it on your own, it just moves, you know. Exactly. Um, so that that balance, that moving with, that circular motion, uh, there's this wonderful moment in capoeira when, when somebody got hit or when somebody stopped, you all of a sudden you have a foot in front of your face and the other person stopped. You actually stop and you take a couple of rounds just walking, just reflecting on what just happened, and then you drop back into the game. And I I've, I've often see coaching as these moments of pausing and reflecting on what just happened. Nice, nice, beautiful analogy. So you can see how I think that we're the, the next five years is going to see an absolute explosion mm. uh, in the best possible way of flourishing <laughs> of people bringing different body practices, uh, you know, in metaphorically, but actually into coaching. Mm -hmm. So coaching is going to become a richer practice. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the transformation that needs to happen is from anthropocentrism to cosmocentrism. And to do this, we need to, we need diversity, diversity, diversity. So, so people will, will bring, as, as has already happened. And this is why I think Coaching is a noble profession. It is, I think it's so wonderful because people are doing this. They're bringing art in, they're bringing metaphor, they're coaching walking and nature and so on and so on. And um, it's such an interesting time. I don't know whether you've heard the new acronym BANI that is being uh, no. used. So we've had VUCA for a long time, volatile, mm. uncertain, complex and ambiguous. ambiguous yeah. And there's a futurist called Hamais Kashal. I think he must be Brazilian or South American anyway. And I was reading about, he's saying that VUCA is now 35 years old or something, you know, mm -hmm. coined in around 985 to describe the post-Cold War era. But now we are post-pandemic. And how can we begin to get a handle on what's happening now? And BANI stands for brittle, uh, um, what is anxious, A for anxious, N for non-linear. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not just complex but nothing is linear any longer 
Uh, we are so used to linear. And then final, the I is incomprehensible. Can we live with not understanding? Can we still work and take a step and make decisions and help our clients, even though it might be incomprehensible? And it occurred to me as I was reading this and reading around it and thinking about it, that very often, of course, coaches are working with incomprehensibility. When I coach, I don't know, I you know, could be coaching uh, uh, a, a, a surgeon in a, in a hospital or, or a, a finance you know, wizard in, in a sovereign wealth fund, for example. I don't comprehend. I don't know everything there is to know about their, their business. So I, we, as coaches, mm -hmm. often work with the incomprehensible. And it's our curiosity mm -hmm. and our explanation of the dynamics and so on that we can begin to open up mm. and, and and understand. So I think it's very interesting. But the brittle piece, I think, is, is very interesting where uh, what we saw in the pandemic is a lot of businesses folding yeah. because we have been they've been mm. pursuing, you know, lean manufacturing, efficient, maximizing efficiency, mm -hmm. which means, you know, cutting back uh, their staff, uh, just in time manufacturing, all of these uh, processes to maximize efficiency leave no slack in the system. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's no resilience. So the yeah, yeah, yeah. pandemic hit, bang. Yeah, and that brittleness makes us very anxious. I wonder if you things that we think are going to be around forever. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 sorry. I, I can't just I can't shake the thought of whether he was sitting there contemplating calling it fragile instead of brittle. Yeah, we've changed the acronym quite interestingly. It would have. <laughs> maybe, maybe he decided not. Maybe that's why he decided not to not to have fragile but brittle. But I think you know also that this idea that things can snap. Yeah. Is very, but yes, it's, it's yeah. describing a kind of fragility mm -hmm. that that we're beginning to think. Oh, the mountains have been there forever, or the seas have been there forever. The 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 Arctic, you know, the ice yeah. cap at the uh, 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 at the uh, Arctic has been there forever. N no longer. Yeah. Actually, things are shifting and changing. Yeah, I'd love to zoom in a little bit on how yeah. that work could look like or could take place. I mean, you already described an, a grounding uh, of like some guided breathing or, you know, just connecting with a buddy. Mm -hmm. um, how might it look like if you work with someone to uh, start initiating that sort of shift or if somebody comes in and uh, they, 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 they want to do something, right? They, they recognize the world that we live in and uh, I wonder what a coaching engagement that like that might look like. Maybe you have a story. Um, maybe you can yeah. share uh, something that illustrates how your coaching approach would look like when you work with someone. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, it starts with the body. It starts with the person and the individual, and it starts with where your passion is and your joy is. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes it takes many years. Um, I'm coaching an individual who began life as a, as a top finance, um, head of finance, let's say. I'm making this anonymizing in a, in, a, in a big fund, a really, really big global fund. And he's good at it, but that's not, I could see it's not where his joy is. You know, when, mm -hmm. as I got to know him over, the, and, and I've known him over many years now, every time I think, I say, look, we're done, you know, I think we're finished now, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're done with that. And then, you know, a few months later, it gives me a call. Says, I've got new things I want to think through. Can we have some sessions? We want to think this through. So it's very, it's very nice because it's an ongoing conversation. And what I noticed was where his real passion was, was in coaching his team and helping people develop because that's the kind of person he is, helping people develop. And so holding that always, always, you know, where is the joy? Where is this? Because where his passion is, is also where his skills are. And he said spreadsheets are boring you know i don't want to do that bit you know and so gradually you know we looked at lots of different options should he leave the there was one point where he considered leaving and running a charity for example that would really be you know upfront this mm -hmm. we're here to benefit humankind or whatever charities in, in a variety of different fields but in the end you know he he stayed where he was and what has happened is that the I'm sure he won't mind me if 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 he can if he ever listens to this and identifies himself. He won't mind me saying that the world began to catch up with him, 
And the organisation he works for began to realise that ESG, environment, social and governance, was actually not just beneficial or nice to have, but actually was fundamental and very aligned with the values of the company anyway. They just hadn't expressed it that way and they hadn't regularised mm. it that way. And he has become sort of head of, if you like, ESG. And it's like the dream job in a way, because at last he's able to put his skills about understanding people and helping them develop mm -hmm. into some formalised, you know, it's been his job to structure some guidelines, uh, some ethical criteria, so that this now will have an impact way beyond his organization mm -hmm. because there aren't many places doing this i mean there are some charities and there's some organizations mm -hmm. and non-profits that are trying to do this but they have such respect in the world of asset management mm -hmm. that now he has a chance to impact much more widely right. in his organization so it starts with you and your client and you don't need to say anything because what you care about as a coach will become present. It becomes present anyway. So when my if my client says, you know, I want, I think you you said a client says, oh, I want to, I want to do so, you know, let's start having the conversation. Let's see what's possible. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's possible with your own skills, your own talents, yeah. your own stamina, your own commitments. The the ecosystem needs yeah. exploring first. What, what what's the context you know how much leverage do you have um is is it a question of helping someone move to a position where they have more decision making power mm -hmm. and so on and so on. there are many many different pathways but i i'm a great believer that every drop in the ocean counts mm -hmm. so if we can help ourselves and, and, and individuals lead more uh let's say i don't know nourishing contributive meaningful lives that's every every drop counts mm. um, and then there's and then there's you know working at the larger scale like the client I've just described but when I'm working with um, for example a, a group of people in a hospice these are doctors the first step is to get them to understand the principle of self-care mm. because they're so caring and so brilliant with everybody else but they're draining their own resources and that drain comes out in an impoverishment of spirit, I would say, a lack of joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, call it tiredness, tired mm. spirits, tired, weary, stressed, weary, you know. stressed. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we, you and I both know, we all know, stress manifests in lots of different ways. So mm -hmm. then they start to get at each other. They're not supportive. They don't work as a mm -hmm. team. They can't see the bigger picture. They 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 become territorial. Yeah. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that people come to the coaching for very often, right? This yeah, is what we exactly. meet and say, that's my agenda. Yeah. And I'm so when somebody comes in with that kind of closed minded or focused on what's right in front of them, um, when you are met with that, which is what most coaches are, right? It's a wonderful engagement if somebody comes, oh, I want to do something about the state of the world. Great. You know, the mm -hmm. kind of coach themselves. You, you don't have, mm -hmm. you have to intervene very little other than open some doors. Mm -hmm. But if somebody comes in with something that is very specific, um, how do you how do you open that up? And you say you start well, with self-care. I work as a transpersonal coach. So I'm always looking at what's the message mm -hmm. in what's, you know, they come with something specific. And they say, you know, I'm exhausted or I'm angry or everything would be fine if I didn't have such a boss. You know, my <laughs> boss is terrible. I'm blah, blah, blah. Well, there's always, there's always another story going on. There's always mm -hmm. another story. And um, I start where there's a chink of light. And sometimes that's going to be through self-care. You know, I might say, you know, how do you take care of yourself? Okay. You know. So did you know that there are seven different types of restoration, for example? You know, oh, no, I didn't know. Oh, let's look at that a little bit. Uh, so I mean, might, you, might you explain some of these concepts? Might you so do seven some... types of restoration is not my idea. Um, it's a concept I've adopted from a speaker called Sandra Dalton-Smith, and you can find mm -hmm. her on TED. She did a TEDx talk. Somewhere. But I love the concept. So with huge uh, sorry, respect um, and gratitude. I... So to jump in, um, I'd, I'd love to hear that, but the question was more about in the coaching session. Yeah, in the coaching would you... session. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So I might start with that. So seven types of mm -hmm. restoration. You know, are you getting enough creative rest in your life, physical rest, mm -hmm. spiritual rest, uh, sensory, people rest, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. That might start there. 
Or we might start from the other end and say, why are you here? What's your sense of purpose? Mm -hmm. How do you find meaning in, in your work and life? You can start wherever there's a chink of light. Mm -hmm. So that requires deep listening, listening under the words, listening for what's not being said. It's mm -hmm. really interesting. And it's also interesting to listen for serendipity. You know, the mm -hmm. client who goes out the room and just as they're leaving, they say, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you that da 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 da. And you go, oh, yeah, my goodness, yeah. why didn't you tell me this right at the beginning? <laughs> That's the most Door in hand thing. principle. <laughs> yeah, isn't it wonderful? You know, the, the sort of, um, oh, there's a word for it in French. Uh, well, it's not quite the esprit d'escalier, de l'escalier, but, you know, it's that sort of, yeah, just as they're leaving the room. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so that's always interesting. What are they not telling you? What's missing? Yeah. Personally, personally, one of my favorite tools, if I'm starting face to face with a client, is to get them to draw a map of their world. Mm. Uh, so paper, pencil. So immediately they're doing something. They're, they're physical. They're not talking to me and yeah. telling me this lovely story, you know, this narrative uh -huh. that they figured out beforehand, uh -huh. which is interesting. It's great. How do they tell their narrative? Um, but, but they're visualizing it. Well, what's the guidance there? How do you invite them to do that? So, a sheet of paper. I, I would always take some colors to a first session. It doesn't crayons or colored markers or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because some people like to color. But, and, and very often you put all the colors in front of them and they pick a pen and one, you know, black, and that's all they use. So that again is significant. Mm -hmm. do they, are they using the richness of of sensuous Already tells you something. or yeah. not. Are they just, it tells, mm -hmm. Everything tells you something. Mm -hmm. And then you just say, draw me a map of your world. They go, sorry, I don't understand. Okay, fine. A map of your world is, I want to know, what do you think is important in your life right now? And right mm -hmm. across from work, so I tell them right at the beginning, I don't draw false boundaries between work and the rest of your life because every, if it's important, it's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. If it's, you know, if you want to bring it here, it's important, it's significant, it will affect your work and your performance and your leadership so i said so draw draw what's important to you. and and it's fascinating what people draw and i explain a little bit about mind maps and use of symbols and color and branches and i said you know i always say pay attention also to the links and the patterns mm -hmm. you know, what's linked with what what's connected where are the connections and the patterns mm -hmm. and, so on. and this um is very insightful for them because they've never sat mm -hmm. down and done this Mm -hmm. And it gives us immediately some great material to work on because yeah. you look at the map and you say, okay, let's explore this a little bit. Tell me about it. You know, yeah. and they start to talk about it and you say, okay, you haven't talked a little bit. There's this little kind of funny stick figure uh, here on the end. Tell me, but, oh, that person, blah, 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 you know. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. it opens right. up so, so many things. So many things. And the way they draw it, you know, some yeah. of them are very neat and I've had boxes and everything's in straight lines. Some uh -huh. of them are completely split. The work is all over here and the personal is all over here mm -hmm. and there's no, and so on and so on. Do you think it's important that you know the background, the theory, or to do some explaining around uh, the concept of it? Um, or do people, do coaches need to know stuff in order to, have people draw things and get curious. I wonder the added benefit or possibly might it even be in the way and distract? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, certainly coaches, coaches need to be trained. We need, because mm -hmm. the training gives us a framework and it gives us a language and it gives us some approaches to start with. Yeah, but do they need to be trained in order to, but, but to do, do to circles do ma and maps? To draw a map of a world. I mean, you can, there's, Tony Buzan's work, he invented this concept, he invented this concept, he, he adopted, he created this concept of mind maps, that the way the mind works, it makes connections. Mm -hmm. um, so you can read about that. But I don't think you need a very heavy duty training to, to, to mm -hmm. do that. You can just ask someone to, to use colors, to use crowns. And it, a lot of it will depend on your own confidence as a coach. Yeah. If you're not confident, then you might want to go and get some, some guidelines and yeah. read a little bit about it. And, You'll find it all online. I mean, um, and and you can put different emphasis on that. So you could ask your client, for example, to put themselves in the middle, and then, mm -hmm. or just not give anything because sometimes the client will leave themselves out. Yeah. So uh, one yeah. of the first questions is, "What have you left out?" Let's they might be deeply uncomfortable with being in the middle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. They might see themselves much yeah. more. So you know, everything that happens 
teaches you something. I mean, I, I come from a visual background, as you know, my mother was an artist and, and, and taught at an art school. So I was brought up in art galleries in going to exhibitions. We did a lot of art at home and so on. So it's just a medium I'm very comfortable with mm -hmm. and very comfortable. I worked for some time also as an art historian and I worked in galleries and so on. Uh, so, so, so it's part of my lexicon, it's part of who I am. Um, if that's not where you feel comfortable, then get yourself some training. But that's not mm. mandatory. You can start. Yeah. Reason, places. reason I was um, rather harshly butting in there is because I have a lot of coaches coming to supervision and they're like, oh, I have to do this before I can do that. I have to get this training. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm not certified yeah. to do this particular technique. And in some ways, Sometimes it's really important that we have that kind of training, especially if we're opening up, especially body work, right? We can open up some pretty deep stuff pretty quickly. And it's important that we feel confident we can hold what's behind those kind of doors. When it comes to drawing maps or experimenting well, with some stuff. But, but, but what you've just said, Yannick, of course, that is very important. It depends what it opens up. Mm -hmm. And that's why coaches are, you know, if we're nervous of something, there's a reason. I would mm. never dismiss anyone's nervousness if they say i need training things if they think they do then the discussion is around the levels of self-confidence because you don't need training to encourage someone to draw a map every child you give them <laughs> some colors can sit down and draw you know what do you mean by a map well they'll do it in their own way and that's fantastic mm -hmm. but it's when it comes to the conversation what does it open up and in general, I mean, I think you probably know my views about training. I think a lot of trainings don't go deep enough and they don't go wide enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I have both the transpersonal uh, deep psychosynthesis background, but I also have a psychoanalytic. You know, I studied and did two years at the Tavistock Clinic. And, and also there's a lot of analytical um, theory that's contained within uh, transpersonal study and so you know looking at what's underneath what's not being said how it's being said you know maybe some of the dynamics that are going on how people talk about mm -hmm. their work colleagues or their family or their you know peers and so on, their friends if you're trained in something that goes deeper and i know you you're trained in existential uh, as well as other other areas you're thinking about how am I understanding this mm -hmm. and therefore what might be the most helpful uh, and effective intervention right now. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any of that, then it's quite difficult to know where to take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can encourage someone to draw that, but, but you might be afraid, your coach might be afraid to like, like ask a deep, you know, who is this person here? And they say, oh, it's my dead father but I feel like he's really... And a girl. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, if you don't... Mm -hmm. and to me, that would be really juicy. You know, yeah. go, okay. So yeah, well, potentially. Can we talk? Can we talk? Potentially, yeah. yeah. Right, because it's so important that we then listen very closely and pick up on how resourced does that person in front of us feel? Because I've, yeah. I've had people in coaching talking about their dead father and their father died 20 years ago and they had processed this really well. And they have gone through their processes and they've made sense of it. And they kind of talked about it as not a quite a matter of fact way, you know, uh, because that sort of thing, I think it never completely leaves. Uh, but like they were very resourced and we could acknowledge it and then continue with the coaching with that in mind. And in some ways it was if it's still heavily in the way and that's where the conversation needs to focus on. Then it makes a lot of sense that maybe this person does that with somebody else than a coach because something else than your coaching might be a better way to open these things up. So but I guess the so question nice what you just said, because if, if someone has put their father on their map, it's clearly an, an important figure in their imaginarium. It's someone who's mm -hmm. them. so it's not a question of blocking or being problematic. Maybe the image they carry with them of their father is a resource, mm. like a wise being or something mm -hmm. like this that they're not using. So that again gives you a tool. Maybe later yeah. in the coaching, you could say, you know, what would your father do in this situation? Or uh -huh. what advice would your father give you uh -huh. in this situation? And it may not have even occurred to them because, oh, my father's dead. I don't talk to them. Well, 
let's do a little gestalt, you know, yeah. let's play a little bit. Let's imagine yeah. that you're, and it might bring tears or it might bring emotion, but it could be a, a, a complete mm. breakthrough. You know, we talked earlier about transformation. I mean, that yeah. could be transformative. So you're looking all the time for, yeah. your client will always be presenting you clues, yeah. clues, clues. And for you, it's, I'd say, I don't want to say easy because it's not easy work, but you have that safety net, so to speak, of having worked as a therapist for many, many years. Um, so you can go there if you need to. I wonder what you would advise or how, like I'm thinking about the coaches who don't have that kind of training and maybe they don't intend to do that kind of training, but they would like to have deeper meaning, more meaningful conversations. How can a coach tell how far they can go? <laughs> It sounds like a have your cake and eat it type of question. <laughs> like, you know, I want to have I want to have a, a delicious meal, but I'm not prepared to put the time in to cook a delicious meal. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. go to a restaurant. You know, I I think that if you want deep and meaningful conversations, it brings us back to what we were saying right at the beginning. You know, your life is your training. Uh, a certain amount of investment. I I believe continuous study. I mean, I'm going on a course myself in November, a two day bodywork course with a wonderful body worker called Philip Shepherd from Canada. Uh, uh, it's coming to Oxford to, to do a two day course. It's just a little introduction. But you know, I'm constantly thinking, oh, yeah. how I've can I resource myself? What can I learn here? How can I, and I do a lot of reading and I read around. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I go back to very basic stuff. I think, do you know, I haven't used such and such technique for such a long time. I'm not even sure I know how to yeah. you know, use that any longer. Right, you know, I pull a book and I, or I think or I look online <laughs> and I think, ah, that's the bit I'd forgotten. Yeah, I need to read. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sorry, you're not going to get a friendly answer from me. I'm going to say <laughs> being a coach is a life commitment. Mm -hmm. I think it's a vocation. I think it's an incredible privilege. I think uh, for me, it's incredibly exciting and stimulating. Um, but I think wisdom has to be earned. And I think, you know, we uh, we go on learning all our lives. That doesn't mean you have to do three years psychotherapy training like I did, four years in fact. Um, but there are many really good courses out there. And I think the Animas course is one in, in, in a very good case in point that says, okay, you don't need to go, need to go away and do a three year psychoanalytic course, but here are some of the concepts. Mm -hmm. Another one is the course that I did at the Tavistock, um, which is working with organizations, looking at systemic and, um, and, and, and very, very good courses out there like um, Simon Weston's Analytic Network. Yeah, he, he posted a that's screenshot great. of his latest group and I'm like, oh, that's Eddie. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm assisting on that a, a little bit and filling in when he has to go off and do other things. <laughs> but, you know, Simon has been absolutely brilliant. His, his brilliance is very much in taking what uh, analytic concepts that people might find really complicated or just mm -hmm. mind-bogglingly incomprehensible mm -hmm. and simplifying them without making them simplistic. Yeah, Understand yeah, yeah. what I'm saying? You know, we had him on the podcast. Ex I, yeah, I mean, I, Simon's uh, uh, brilliant. So your, your, your podcast listeners will be familiar with it. So there are lots of courses out there that one can do that, that, that refresh and replenish and, and, and make us feel better resourced. Mm -hmm. to do the same and i think you know given how quickly the world is changing all the time and not to do myself out come on my transpersonal training where we where we look very much at this and i work with my colleague christopher connolly and we're looking at transitions because mm -hmm. it seems like we're in a permanent transition mm -hmm. either moving jobs or leaving or moving mm -hmm. country like you moving mm -hmm. to another country this concept of how can we do this with with expertise rather mm. than make it a, a drama or, a, or, a, or a, you know, because of course, yeah, anyway. So yeah. with the transpersonal, we're looking also at transitions as well mm -hmm. and, uh, and bringing the more the spiritual, keeping the spirit very much alive in that. Yeah, yeah, and in a banny world, uh, yeah, well, there is nauseating gonna, speed of development. Yeah, yeah you're going to hear yeah. it more around. Uh, well, I, I quite like the idea of living in a funny world. <laughs> <laughs> so hey i i have an eye on the time uh we said we're aiming for an hour i, I wonder if there's a, a last question that would be helpful to ask hmm. 
What um, question would you like to be asked to uh, well, you mark I, the ending you of this? I, yes, you know that I've got a chapter coming out in a book next year. I think it's still, they're still gathering in all the other contributions about hope, which I think is a really interesting idea yes. at the moment. There are a lot of people working in coaching and working in the field of climate change who are feeling very glum, very gloomy, um, despondent, maybe even despairing, mm -hmm. um, maybe even depressed uh, about the world. And, and I can go there too. I can get very I, depressed. But yeah, I, yeah go on. But I yeah, think no. holding hope is, is so important. That that was the question that I would have asked if you wouldn't have said anything. What's the what's the hope? Yeah. yeah, how do we well how do we hold the hope? Uh, I'm thinking about coaches, right? And yeah, yeah, what's the role of the coach in helping this kind of radical hope come about or giving it an opportunity to flourish? Because we do need it. Uh, we, do, we do, otherwise we might just want to go back under the duvet and pull the duvet over our heads yes, yes, yes. and forget about it. And everybody is susceptible. We're human. Of course we, 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 we feel that. There's so much information around, we can't hide, you know. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, uh, my chapter is called Radical Hope. Um, um, I can't even remember the subtitle. It's something about rooted in... You probably, uh, I know that I, I, I shared, shared a little bit about it with you, but it's, it's about, I think, rooting ourselves in something. I think having a sense of uh, what am I connected to mm -hmm. is very important for coaches. Mm -hmm. I, I used to talk about, here's, here's an interesting thing that r reminded me when we talk about holding the hope, I used to say that your job as a coach is to hold the confidence, the self-confidence of your client until they are ready to take it back for themselves. Ah, and I think that. some it's a, it's a nice idea that when our job is to hold it for someone else, maybe our job is to hold the hope for our clients until they're ready to take it back for themselves. Because in mm. doing that for someone else, we also reignite our sense of hope in ourselves and whether we can look at uh, spending time with what with the good. I mean, all the things that other people say of, you know, immersing yourself in the good news, not just the bad news, mm -hmm. all the good stuff that's happening out there. And it's really increasing now. It's really, really increasing. Understanding where you come from in the sense of where is your place in the world? Where are your roots? Mm -hmm. What nourishes you? is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Understanding as a coach that one drop makes a difference. Mm -hmm. that our contribution in supporting this human being and helping this person make their contribution is, is worthwhile. It's what we do. Um, what else would you say? Holding the spirit alive, having a practice. Mm -hmm. Having a practice, coming back to the body, I think can be incredibly yeah. nourishing. I mean, my own practice is yoga and I do, you know, two, three times, a couple of times a week, two to three times I do classes, but every morning, even if it's just a little bit. Mm. So it reminds you, yes, I'm still alive. Yes, grounding. I'm grateful, it's grounding, mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah. It, it also made me think that um, coaching, I wondered if coaching is even possible without hope. Because when somebody mm -hmm. goes to see me and they they don't have access to something in the future that is that is worth holding on to, um, I, we can still have a conversation. Is it still coaching? Is I guess up for debate. But I so uh, the question I had in my mind, and I made a little note was: Well, is coaching even possible without hope, or is coaching is the the value of coaching to cre perhaps create hope? Yeah, such good question, Yannick. I, I don't know the answer, but it reminds me of a couple of clients that I've had in my life where I felt a sense of hopelessness hmm. and it's like I'm picking up on their sense of hopelessness. It's and a tough one to coach. Emotions because the company hmm. has given them coaching and said, you need some coaching because you're annoying, you're pissing off your team members, or you're annoying <laughs> your clients or whatever it is. And they come with such a dispirited, it's like the spirit is dead there. And I really can find myself absorbing that. And mm -hmm. It's tough to sit with. Answer is. I don't know what the answer is, but sometimes you just have to sit with that. And as I say, hold mm. the hope because they can't. They can't access that sense yeah. of hope or that sense of, of, of joy or that sense of spirit. Uh, and sometimes it might be something very, very small helping yeah. your clients. Where do you find joy? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can generate that kind of hope, even with someone who's generally feeling quite hopeless. And even and I, if we don't even call it hope, hope might be even too big for them. Oh, yeah. I've got yeah. one client used to, I got her to, to buy herself a bunch of flowers. A couple huh. of times a week, she would buy a bunch of flowers and take them home and put them on it, you know, and just, that oh, gave her joy. It literally, small, small things when yeah. people are really, really down. And yeah, I mean, I who knows the seeds yeah. that we sow. Yeah, and this is again where we're at an area where a coach might wonder, might this person benefit more from working with a therapist or another coach who brings, you know, that kind of breadth of training? And I, the question I always yeah. offer clients, uh, coaches is, am I willing and am I able to hold yeah. this space for this person right now? Well, I, I take a slightly different take and I'm aware of time. I think if someone has chosen you, then... The first question I ask myself is, why have they chosen me? Mm. And this goes for, and I say the same thing in supervision. I, I supervise a lot of coaches and they always go, oh, you know, I'm not ready yet or I don't feel able to and I need more training, you know, like you were saying. And I say, why do you think this person has chosen you? Let's imagine they've, that they have some supernatural, they just know, knew you were the right person. And then we begin to, to get into all the strengths that the coach has that they don't even call or think about as strengths mm. and it's right from who they are as a human being so mm. being able to see ourselves as an instrument we are a stradivarius yeah. violin but we're playing chopsticks you know a lot of the time we're, we're saying okay here's a here's a technique here's an approach we need to do this but mm. actually allow ourselves a little bit of courage and to know at any point to be transparent, to be able to say to the client, hmm, I'm wondering if it might be more helpful for you to go and see it. I've, I've, passed, I've passed clients on to therapists. I say, I think it might be more helpful to, for you to have a space every week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't afford me every week. <laughs> you know, it's like it's too much. Um, and, and, then they, and, and that's been really, really helpful for mm -hmm. them. But, but in tra with transpersonal coaching, one of the things I love is it's taking a lot of, and it's the same with Simon's work with the analytic network coaching, is we're taking concepts and approaches and attitudes and models that belong to the therapeutic world. And we're saying, that's not good enough. We need them in the ordinary, everyday mm -hmm. world because they have mm -hmm. so much to offer. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I will teach with transpersonal. So I do it with supervision, I do it with women working with clients yeah. ah, Hetty. <laughs> we could, I, I, <laughs> we, could we could talk for many days i'm sure uh, yeah. maybe someday uh, we will um but uh, for now i just thank you um i really love what you're opening up and i hope that uh, people who are listening or watching this uh go through some of those doors that have been opened um and explore some of those uh things maybe you know, next time they travel, next time they seek uh, to gather some more experiences and make time to integrate them, that maybe they think they think about this. Yeah, good, good. Listen, Yannick, thank you so much for the pleasure and privilege of our conversation today. Wish you very well in your own transition to, to, to Berlin. And uh, I'm sure we will have more conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Eti. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to Coaching Uncaged. If you want to find out more about becoming a coach, developing your coaching skills further, or training as a coaching supervisor, then head along to animascoaching.com. Thanks again and catch you on the next episode.